I, I guess the main thing that Tony and I talked about was that I was going to um, say something this time about, about going beyond what I had done in Guatemala to um, programs that are, are um, taking place in, in Mexico and in the United States, specifically here at Texas. Because the programs that I was working with in Guatemala were not university programs. They were, um, uh, they were extra escolar. They were, they were people who were learning how to do linguistics um, without it necessarily counting for anything in a university setting. Um, most of the people that, or many of the people that worked with me in Okma did indeed go to the university and, and and start doing their university training uh, concurrently with learning linguistics. They had some problems um, at the universities because they, generally speaking, knew more about the linguistics of their languages than the universities did, or than the professors in the universities did. And so there was a little bit of sometimes conflict about those issues. It depended really on the professor and the student, and sometimes it worked out okay, and sometimes there was conflict. Um, it, it's something that you could expect when people are devoting their working life 100% to doing linguistics on their own languages that they might, in, in fact, if you're successful, they ought to know more than their professors know about the linguistics of their languages. But some of the professors in their university programs did not, um, appreciate that point and they felt like some of the students were showing them up or something like that and so there was a little bit of conflict <clears throat> but at any rate what they were doing with me was not a university program it was a it was a program in which they were doing the analysis of languages and then using that analysis to write about the languages so they were writing the, some the materials that I talked about last time things like grammars pedagogical grammars um, reference grammars, other kinds of, of grammars, also dictionaries also, although dictionaries are a real problem. It takes a very long time to write a good dictionary. So I, I'd say that there was less work on dictionaries than on other things. Um, they also collected st stories and made children's books out of them and and, over, and all in all, as I also said last time, published over a hundred different works. Um, so what, what else went on then? Well, we initiated or we, yeah, we initiated a few kinds of uh, participations from other linguists and uh, other linguists in particular that, that provided a model for taking this kind of program to the universities. In particular, I began to invite linguists to come and give intensive short courses at OKMA. These would be a week or two weeks and they included linguists such as um, Judith Asen and Roberto Savala, who came several times each. Um, Mercedes Nino Murcia, who had worked in the Andes. Terry Kaufman, who had worked in most of Mesoamerica. Uh, Jim Munlock, who worked on Quiche, and, and probably some others that I'm not recalling at the moment. Um, and th these individuals then would give short courses, like I say, on work that they had done and research that they had done. And one of the first was Roberto Savala giving a short course on his master's research on the motion verbs. And later on, he gave another short course on some of his later work. And Judith Asen gave uh, any number of short courses. She's very well known for her, for her work on complement clauses in, um, in Mesoamerican languages. And she works specifically on Mayan, on, on Tzotzil, but the the but she she in in terms of working with Okma, she she, she gave the complement course, the first one at Okma. 
She's known now for having given a bunch of them in Mexico, but the first one she ever gave was with Okma. And these, I, the idea of giving intensive short courses of a week or two weeks long, then got <laughs> appropriated and imported into Mexico through Cieses, and especially through Roberto Savala, who has kept up the tradition at Cieses by having lots and lots of short courses being offered there. I know that some of you have given such short courses. Um, uh, Tony has, and Danny has, and there's other people, um, many other people who have given short courses at CSS. Judy Asen has given a lot of short courses, and, and, and that's why I had to mention that her first short course on compliments on complement structure was given at Okma because everybody thinks it started in Mexico, but it didn't. It started, it started in Guatemala. And, um, but it doesn't really matter where it started. The point is where it went. And it went to the university students, mostly master's students, but now also PhD students who, um, who are at Okma. I mean, excuse me, who are at CSS in, in Mexico. And so they all had the benefits of um, working with quite a few people who gave um, really spectacularly interesting and good short courses. I participated in some at the very beginning when those short courses were started, they were a little bit open to people not at CSS. They are no longer open because there were too many people that were uh, coming and CSS wanted to reserve them for their students. But um, they were, they, they, these have been very interesting and very well done short courses on all kinds of different topics. And they have um, really contributed to not only the education of the students at CSS, but also to their publications. So that there have been, uh, as I said, a number of short courses on complement clause structure that Judy has given. Um, Judith Asen, and there have also been uh, uh, a recently a, um, a short courses on relative clauses given by um, uh, Ivano Caponegro and Harold Torrance at UCLA. And um, Tony and other people have given um, short courses on, on uh, um, uh, verbal art. And Danny, what did you do? I can't remember now. I think it was, I think it was historical linguistics. Something with historical, right. Yeah, it was and, either that or language contact. Right. Um, so the point being that, that the students at CSS, all of whom are fluent speakers of some Mesoamerican language, which does not necessarily mean member of a community of speakers of a Mesoamerican language. There are people who are, there are several students who were not members of a community of speakers of Mesoamerican languages, but are fluent, they learned them. And so the, 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 the main um, criterion for becoming a student at CSS was that the students had to speak fluently. And the reason is that they always gave was that there would not be time in their programs for them to go do the field work necessary to collect enough data to really know how the languages work. So they had to know ahead of time and be able to um, collect the data from their own, their own, um, from their own speech and the speech of people they knew. And so I'd say that the vast majority of students at CSS have indeed been members of indigenous communities who were who where the languages that they work on were spoken but there have been a couple of notable exceptions in particular um, um, Nestor who works on Otomi who is from Baja California which is not a place where Otomi is spoken Nestor Hernandez Green and um, and also um, uh, Patty, if you could remember the whole name of um, the guy from Brazil, please. I'm sorry, who, which guy? Who oh, studied at CSS? Elder. Oh, Elder Freddy uh, Ferreira. Okay. The one who worked on Yanomami. Say, yeah, say it again. Uh -huh. Elder 
Ferreira. Elder. Ferreira. Okay. Ferri Ferreira, Ferreira. And he, um, he did his master's at CSS and then went on to do a PhD in Europe. And there's been several others who, and he was a fluent speaker, but not a member of the community of Yanomami. And the same thing was going on with um, several other people who, those are the two that are sort of the most, um, uh, most recognizable. Tony, were you going to say something? It, yeah, it was just wanted to add that there are people who are learners, who are members of communities, but had to learn the languages um, uh, as they were uh, as adults rather than um, having learned it as children. So Oscar would be an example of that. Right, but he had to be fluent by the time he worked. Right. In, right. Uh, and, and, uh, this is um, Oscar Lopez, right? Yeah. Emiliana, yeah. is that his, Oscar Lopez? Yeah, uh, Lopez Nicolás. Okay, and the point being that he was a member of a Zapotec community, but was not a speaker. Um, but it doesn't matter. They had to be fluent by the time they went to Ciesis. They it, Whether they were a member of a community or not, uh, the, the issue was fluency in the language. And that I think is a very interesting way to go about um, uh, working. We, we certainly don't do that here. We do not require fluency in an indigenous language for our students. And some, some of you are fluent in an indigenous language and some are not, but it's not a requirement. But I think it's a, it's a tremendously interesting requirement for the linguistics program at CSS. And it does mean that there is an, an unusual group of students. At any rate, one of the things that CSS imported and it started I say with a great deal of pride in Guatemala was the idea of having short courses offered by all kinds of other linguists who are not um, members of CSS and members of the faculty there and who um, <clears throat> would come down for a couple of weeks. And Tony and Danny could even could talk about that a little bit they, since they both participated in uh, the, the idea of giving the short courses and, um, and they gave short courses. The, that people came down and gave these short courses. And I think it vastly enriched the, the university program at CSS. So there was the program that had been working quite, um, quite well in, in Guatemala for people who were, um, might have been studying in the university, but this had nothing to do with the university. And they were just learning to do the analysis of their own languages and, and applying that analysis to various kinds of projects like writing grammars and writing um, <clears throat> uh, storybooks and writing dictionaries and so on and so forth. Um, but it was now being applied within a university program. So I think that was like the next step. The idea that not only could the methodology be applied within a university program, but that we the next step in, in, in doing any kind of um, training of speakers in the linguistics of their own languages probably needed to take place at a university. Now, there are no universities in Guatemala that were capable or willing to do that kind of program, but, but CSS in Mexico was. CSS has a, a pretty robust linguistics program. It besides, it has um, three people who are interested in typological and descriptive and documentary linguistics, um, Roberto Savala, Gilles Polian, and, and um, uh, Balam Mateo Toledo. It also has people that work on <clears throat> language socialization, that work on sociolinguistics, that work on a number of other kinds of fields. Most the, the three, the first ones I mentioned are all located in San Cristobal, the branch in San Cristobal de las Casas. And every, all of, not all of, but many of the other linguists are located in the branch in Mexico City. There are, as well as Balam, um, Oscar Lopez is also on the faculty at, in, in um, he's in Golfo, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, in Oaxaca. Yeah, and, and Emiliana is on the faculty in Mexico City. And um, <clears throat> is there anybody else that we should mention as being on the faculty of, of CSS? 
At any rate, it has Sal a- Salome Gutierrez. Salome um, is in- Yeah, Salome, uh, he's, uh, he's, in, he's in one of- In Veracruz. Golfo, it's in Veracruz, right. And so there are, a, and he's a speaker of, of, um, of Sierra Popoluca and Emiliano, of course, is a speaker of Chatino and Oscar, a speaker of Zapotec. So we've got a pretty interesting faculty um, at CSS, plus they have all these branches and the students go around from place to place. They study some in Mexico City and some in San Cristobal. So it's a kind of an interesting um, way to, at first they were having the faculty all go to Mexico City to teach. And faculty didn't much like that because their homes are in other places, the ones that don't live in Mexico City. So now they have the students go around because it doesn't make all that much difference to them because they're, no matter who they are, they, they don't um, live in Mexico City. They, they live in some other community. So I would say that the, um, um, the fact that, that CSIS then established the first university program in linguistics for speakers of indigenous languages in the first one in the world really, and certainly the first one in Latin America was, um, was, was a wonderful thing. And it didn't have anything to do with me except that the model of doing these short courses was imported into CSS from, um, from short courses that we had done in Guatemala and then they were done in Mexico and they were, then they were done in the university. So there was, uh, in other words, a contribution was being made that was wider than the place where the original contribution was, was um, developed. And then the other, um, the next step, or almost simultaneous step really, was to establish a program in indigenous languages of Latin America at a US university. And that is the program we have here at Texas. And Tony is gonna to say that I had something to do with that. And I did because I was hired specifically for that program. But in fact, Tony had a great deal to do with that because Tony was the um, chair of the Department of Linguistics at the time that I was hired and he, he has a view of how the program um, developed that, that, that takes some of the things that I talked about and, and, and developed them. But I have a view that the program developed because of things that Tony said, and I developed those. And so in fact, I think it was a cooperation between the two of us that got the program going initially. That was in 2001, that's when I um, came here. And uh, my, my interest at the very beginning, from the beginning on was to be active in indigenous languages of Latin America. There were no other universities that were, that had that as their main specialty. The University of Oregon mostly works in South America. The um, University of California of Santa Barbara mostly works in North America, including Mexico and, and, um, and, and North America, north of, north of Mexico. And, it, but, but there was no place that was really uh, specifically working in Latin America. So, it seemed to me that a university program should be working in Latin America. Now, Tony tells me a very interesting story that people who are interested in the position of trying to get that, this program going, mostly would think of it in a very university-centered way of, um, okay, a program on the indigenous languages of Latin America, well, we should have a research center and we should do a lot of research and we should get a lot of grants and we should, um, you know, have our students do research and have them get a lot of grants. And that's what we should do as a research center. And that's not what I thought of at all. I, what, <laughs> I, I kind of missed out on that whole thing. What I thought of was, well, what we should do is we should um, try to get students in our program who speak the languages and students who want to work on the languages. And we should enable them to do their work 
both speakers and non-speakers, but in specifically, um, some of the students should be speakers. And so I was more interested in who the students were than in what the research grants were gonna, were gonna tell us. Because my experience is that faculty, good faculty always get research grants. That's not a problem. We didn't have to have a special program for getting research grants. You know, people on our faculty, Danny and Patty, for instance, have been going gangbusters and getting research grants and they, so if there's some of their students. And, and we don't, that doesn't have to be a special part of the program, that should be an assumption. But what we did need was students who were interested in these languages, and there are lots of them, we just had to get them here to Texas. And we needed people who were speakers of the languages, and we also had to get them here to Texas. And I have to say, we've been pretty successful. Um, and we have now, seven, eight, nine, um, counting, um, counting Emiliana, who graduated in anthropology, we, we, have, we have graduated nine, I believe, um, speakers of indigenous languages of Latin America in mostly in linguistics and, and, and also Emiliana in anthropology um, from our program in, in the description of, the description and documentation uh, and, uh, of Latin American indigenous languages, plus a whole lot of people who didn't start off being speakers of these languages, they may be speakers now, but they are, um, but they began to work on them and they were not originally speakers. So we didn't have a requirement like CSS did that uh, people in our program had to already be speakers. It just, that would not have worked in, in, in this university. Um, and, but we, what we did have was that our, the people who came here had to be very, very interested in indigenous languages of Latin America, either because they were their, their their home languages or because they were interested for other reasons. And so all of you um, know that we are, that we've had a great many people, the latest to graduate were, um, uh, the very latest to graduate was Jaime Perez and Ambrosio, who Ambrosio worked with Tony and, and Jaime worked with me. And they're both very well situated in um, other universities now in the United States. And we also know that we have quite a few speakers of indigenous languages who are currently um, enrolled in the program. Plus we have a lot of people who are either learning the languages or who will be learning the languages or possibly will never learn the languages, but will do some wonderful linguistics work on the languages. Some people are really good at learning languages and some people like me are not as good as we would like to be. And so we don't learn a language to fluency and that's okay, you can still do some work. Although it's a lot easier if you can actually speak the language. So, um, so now the whole model of working with speakers of indigenous languages and other people who may not be speakers but who are interested in indigenous languages has been exported or incorporated into an American program. And the thing that makes Texas a little different from Santa Barbara or, or Oregon is that we um, quite frankly cover all of Latin America, not just one little special area. And, um, and we're especially interested in training speakers of these languages and, and that which not to the not, which does not mean that we're not interested in and working with people who are not speakers or are not native speakers, it just means that we're putting a little bit of attention to the speakers. So one special corollary says Tony is having Spanish as a second lingua franca among us. Yes, and that is um, unfortunate for Ivana, but that's okay, Ivana. We all speak English too, so you can um, you'll you can get along with that. Um, Ivana, as you know, speaks a North American language, and the reason that she was admitted is quite frankly because Tony is an expert on the family of languages to which her language belongs and so we thought we had somebody who could who she could work with very um, fruitfully um, but we but we've had inquiries from people who want to work on an African language or want to work on an Asian language and we say well you know it sounds very interesting but we're not really the place for it because what we specialize in is Latin America I think I'd like to find out if anybody has some questions about how all this began. So in Texas, we started in 2001 and we um, fairly rapidly um, 
initiated with, well, I had some startup funds that enabled us to, um, to invite some people here to learn English and then become part of the program. Some of them did indeed learn English and become part of the program. And we have um, um, since that time uh, been able to invite quite a few people to join us. So any questions that any of you have? Surely you must, I know you have questions. I, I'm part of this experience when I came to UT when I was accepted. I actually, I only applied to UT, nowhere else. Mm -hmm. So if I wanted to do a PhD, it was at UT because there were the right people to work with. And, and I don't regret about my decision because I, I feel very supported in the program. And throughout the program, like uh, I have experienced like the grant support and everything, like I'm very pleased. That's the only thing that I would comment. Okay, that, thank you. The point is being made that, that people who come to UT are um, finding something that is actually substantially different what, from what you find in other universities. Danny? I don't know if this is a direction that you want to go in right now or not, but it, I, I'd be interested to hear you talk a little bit more about um, the obstacles, practical and, and ideological to having other, other departments do this uh, support having indigenous students. Um, I, I know that um, it's, not, it's not just a matter of saying, let's have more indigenous students, right? There's, there are some real uh, efforts that have to be made at uh, many different levels. And I think that's one of the successes uh, of this program. Well, I don't know that I can answer that entirely because UT is the place where I, that I know. And there's a lot of other universities that I, that I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, so the question is other departments here at UT or elsewhere? Are you talking about linguistics departments at other universities or other things I, here? I, I think maybe what, what I'm really just asking is um, for you to maybe develop a little bit more um, how our department has made that work. Okay, um, well, the first thing you need is you need to have people who either know English or learn English. Finding funding for English is absolutely horrible. It, there is no funding for English. So this, that's the first challenge. You want to bring some people in who, who um, <clears throat> can work on their own languages. They are fluent speakers of their own languages and of Spanish. Um, maybe they do or don't know English. I mean, we're, Oscar, you are very, a very good language learner and you do speak English very well, but lots, lots. <laughs> okay, Tony is saying I focused on this right away. When I came here, people were not willing to, to, to um, support our students for learning English. So finding some amount of support that included a year of English was crucial. And we did it in various ways. It's not very well set up. If somebody came to us now and said, I wanna study with you, but I can't speak any English, what are you gonna do for, for me? We'd have to say, gosh, we don't know because we, don't, we haven't been able to establish a, <clears throat> a, a formal ongoing source of funding for studying English. Everybody is, might be interested in other things, but they're not interested in in, in, in supporting English. And the problem, of course, is that to study in a US university, you have to be able to understand English at the very least and write in it. Maybe you don't have to speak it so much, but you have to be able to write and understand it. And so the people that came here, it's not that we want everybody to be an English speaker. It's just that if you're in a university like the University of Texas, there are courses that are given in, in English. And so you have to be able to understand that. Um, I got a little bit of my startup funds, every faculty who comes has some funding that to, to begin whatever program they're interested in with. And I use some of those startup funds to, um, to, to 
to pay for English for several people who came here. Um, to the two, I actually, I paid for four people and two of them, two of them entered the program and graduated. The other two for various reasons did not. And the two that entered the program and graduated were <clears throat> Felix Hulka and um, Juan Jesus um, um, Vasquez. So you probably know, many of you may know either Felix or Juan Jesus. Um, Felix, of course, was from Peru and a speaker of Quechua. And Juan Jesus is from Chiapas and a speaker of Chol. So both of them have, um, I was able to get English for them. Um, some of the other people, well, Emiliana already spoke English. Eladia already spoke English. Um, <clears throat> Balam already spoke English because I had gotten English for him at, a, at my prior university. Um, Thelma Khan did not speak English and, and, and her English was paid for out of um, uh, private funds. That is to say, Balam paid for it. He was her husband at that point and he paid for her English. Um, other people, I don't even remember all the ways that in which it was paid for, but it's, it's hard. Um, well, Jaime brilliantly learned English out of nowhere, but Jaime is a, you know, he's another language nut. So he learns languages brilliantly out of nowhere. That's what he does. Um, <laughs> one of the things he does anyway. Um, and then they're probably, well, I don't know how, Oscar, how you actually learned English, but of course you also uh, brilliantly learned it out of nowhere. So, <laughs> so and, and we didn't have to worry about English for, for Oscar because he already speaks English. Gladys, what did you do? You, you, oh, you were a student at NYU. Primarily. Yeah, I did yeah, my MA at NYU and I learned a little bit of English there, but also in Bolivia. But in Bolivia, we really don't master like that uh, uh, intermediate proficiency of English. But Oscar did and Gabriel. Gabriel actually, he studied in a center for English or something in Bolivia. And that's where he learned. Well, what most people have found is that studying English in um, in a non-English speaking country is very difficult. It's just like, I find the same thing to be true of Spanish and I didn't do it. I learned Spanish in Guatemala and where it was being used by everybody all the time. And therefore I had the appropriate background for learning Spanish. Um, and Guatemala was a perfect country to do that in because at the time when I studied Spanish, which was in the seventies, um, there were really relatively few English speakers compared to other Latin American countries so that it, so, so that English was never heard on the streets or in parties or at you know mm -hmm. social gatherings it was always Spanish in Guatemala and so I got a lot of you know daily every a, a, daily um, enforcement reinforcement of of my Spanish when I was learning it which was great because eventually I had to be able to speak Spanish which was at least semi-academic and so on. At first, my Spanish was 100% campesina. And then I, you know, gradually began to manage to um, speak it respectably, as well as speak it <clears throat> the way that country people did. <clears throat> I think you have to be able to speak both. Unlike, for instance, as Vivian could, I'm sure, tell us, most of the interpreters, court interpreters, who claim that they can't understand any of the Mexicans who speak to them because they're not speaking Spanish. Well, that's nonsense. Of course they're speaking Spanish, but they're speaking Spanish from the um, countryside and, and the court interpreters are speaking a completely different register, a high register and especially high because of the courts. And, you know, they, so they claim that they don't understand the people that they're, that they're hired to serve, which I find very peculiar, in fact. Um, okay. so. So yeah, the, 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 it's, it's, it's critical to try to find funding for English and it's very, very difficult. So that's the first thing. The next thing is to find people who are good at linguistics. Not, not everybody is. Some people wanna do some kind of language work but they're not gonna be good at linguistics. They're gonna be good at social relations or the language and context or other things like that. So you have to find people who can do the linguistics. And when I was working in Guatemala, that was pretty easy. We had, 
we would call in a bunch of people to take a short course with us. Not one of the short courses taught by outsiders, but a short course, ta course taught by me or one of my um, one of my assistants, sort of like TAs up here of instruction. And we would um, teach a couple of weeks of linguistics, reading and writing and linguistics. And then we would test people and you could tell immediately who got it and who didn't. It was, it was really, really easy. In fact, the people who got it did real well in the testing situation. The people who didn't get it, didn't get it. And that was, um, uh, that was possible because we would have, we, we did get the funding to have people in a big group and be able to, to talk to that whole group and also to test them. What wasn't possible was to be able to carry that to other places. We had to work with, because you, you have to have a body of people who are being supported by you to live in order to be able to do the testing that we wanted to do. So we couldn't, we couldn't, um, you couldn't take that to the people who wanted to uh, learn, who wanted to be admitted to UT. And of course the people that wanted to be admitted to CSS didn't need English because they needed to be able to read English but they didn't need to be able to speak it. And they all had, um, all of everybody who went to CSS, I think, has at least some reading ability in English, but not necessarily. Oh, Juan Pablo, that's what you were teaching, in fact, right? No, I was teaching Spanish writing. Oh, Spanish writing. Okay. But, but they were pretty much required to do some reading and writing in English, um, whether and however they could manage. Okay, so um, how, how to get this stuff going? Well, finding money for English is really hard. Finding Finding some funding for the program itself is easier than finding the money to, to, for language learning. It's just um, <clears throat> that, 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 that sometimes appeals to people. And we were very lucky at OKMA, we found funding from uh, Norwegian Foreign Aid, as well as I, I went through it the other day, a, a local university and um, some, some other programs, like I had a Fulbright that supported me one year and um, and USAID supported the university that then used their, their funding to support us. Um, CSS is supported by the government of Mexico. So they get their funding through the government and the government of Mexico supports universities or up till now has supported universities much better than most other Latin American countries. And so the the support for CSS is 100% or at least all the important support comes entirely from the, from the government. Um, there's a little bit of anti-university anti feeling going around Mexico these days, and, but we hope it, it won't last, but who knows? <laughs> Those of you who are, um, who are Mexicans, just try to make it not last, please. We want, we want Mexico to continue to support universities. Um, yes, the Ford Foundation supported uh, all kinds of programs that had to do with um, uh, learning either languages or linguistics or anthropology or whatever um, in various countries. They had a program in Guatemala, for instance. I don't know where else. Uh, the Ford Foundation is a little strange because it's a private foundation. So the people who run those programs have absolute control over the programs. And sometimes you don't really know what's going on in the Ford Foundation because it is private. It's, um, but, it, but it has contributed quite a bit of money. They supported us here for a while, including English training. I can't remember the details, Tony. I think we certainly had good relations with Ford Foundation when we started up. And there was a director of the Ford Foundation programs in Guatemala, and maybe they were working in Mexico too at that time. I don't know who, who, who met with us here and was very, was very generous to UT. Kind of liked our idea, ideas at the beginning, but, but that didn't last. With all these right. foundations, you know, the, 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 it never lasts. The, the, <laughs> they, oh, that's a great idea, they, everybody says. And then five years later, well, been there, done that, do something else. 
So you can't count on the foundation support lasting for a very long time. People want to show results in sort of yearly increments, and that means that they have to um, change the programs and, and say, okay, I did this and this and this and this when my in my five-year tenure, and now it's time to do something else. Yeah, and also I think it now with the... Um... I think if a lot of the people in Mexico, they were able to study abroad with uh, the money that uh, CONACYT will give them as part of, you know, uh, the scholarship. You could actually, you know, go anywhere in the world and uh, uh, they will, you know, pay you to, uh, to do that. But now, um, starting about like uh, three years, uh, they cut all the um, funding to go study abroad. So basically like if you wanna get fund, I mean, uh, that's a very unique thing, right? Like in nowhere in Latin America, you uh, get paid to go to graduate school. So uh, we are, you know, I think that the uh, graduate students are really lucky that way. It's, it's enough, you know, I talk to students, it's enough to live in, but um, if you wanna study abroad, then you're gonna have to come up with your own funding. So they don't allow that for now. So we don't know how long that will stay, but uh, um, that's how it is now. Well, that's one of the, one of the things that I was referring to when I said that, that the Mexican um, programs, uh, higher educational programs have unfortunately be been receiving less government support than they did in the past. So study abroad is one that has um, perhaps fallen by the wayside, but some of the, some of the support directly in the universities has also fallen by the wayside so that uh, it's harder to, to, to run academic programs right now in Mexico. But I still I maintain that Mexico has had up till now, certainly the best programs in linguistics of any country in Latin America. And um, there's quite a few universities in Brazil that have some kind of program in, in linguistics, but, it's, but none of them are um, directly, um, uh, none of them are of the stature and of the intent, as far as I can tell, of the CSS programs. And I mean, the rest of you know your countries, you know whether they could could compete or not. But I, I think that Mexico has been fairly unusual in terms of its support up till now of academic programs that have um, also supported academic work on the indigenous languages and indig indigenous cultures and so on, partly because Mexico has a large indigenous population and, and uh, other Latin American countries, except for Guatemala and Bolivia, all other Amer Latin American countries have a relatively small indigenous population um, compared to the whole population. And so um, that's one thing that, I mean, Mexico likes to pretend that this is indigenous population is a heritage from the 16th century, but it's not, it's, it's there, right there in Mexico where people live and are, members of indigenous communities, whether like it or not. And, so, but, but um, so, so anyway, <laughs> there are, there, that's one reason why the academic programs about indigenous communities, inc including their languages, I think have had some success in Mexico is because it's, it's a large part of the population that we're talking about. Thank you again, Nora. Oh, thank um, you, Nora. My pleasure, everybody. <laughs>